Dear friends, after leaving Islam for three years, I have now reverted back to it. I know, trust me, I know what you're saying. I know the pattern. You're saying, Mufasil, oh, come on, cut the crap. You were never an apostate. That's exactly what you're going to say. But the reality is I did leave Islam because I paid a lot for that. I lost my family. I lost my children. I lost my security. I lost my health. I lost my mom. I had a bypass surgery. My mom didn't even come to see me. You know, I lost a lot. And you are all witness to that. Don't lie to yourself. You have to believe I apostated and I, I was sincere in my apostasy. I made thousands of videos criticizing Islam and I was the first man to debate world-renowned scholars being an ex-Muslim agnostic atheist. So I proved my dedication. I also helped many leave Islam, many leave their religions. So that should be enough for you, my dear friends. But if you remember, I left Islam after the uh, terrorist attack in Paris woke me up and it made me realize that Islam was not the religion for me. I woke up from my understanding of Islam that I had to a new understanding. And the understanding was no religion, no organized religion was true. And I kept on interpreting Islam the way I thought was true. And I found all the justifications of believing the extremists and the terrorists were the real Muslims. And the apologetics uh, the vast majority, overwhelming majority of peace-loving Muslims were not truly Muslims. Well, I was wrong. After the attack, the terrorist attack in the mosque in Christchurch woke me up again. Because this time, Muslims were the victims. And I was shocked to see the rejoices amongst vast majority of Hindus, amongst vast majority of various communities who were saying it's better that Muslims learn their lessons. But I was also amazed to see love amongst many non-Muslims. So that brought me to the reality that we need to serve humanity from a different perspective. And I slowly realized that world politics had to do a lot with religious fanaticism at its roots. Wahhabi Islam was given statehood by, unfortunately, Britain and America by giving birth to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia gave rise to world Wahhabism and the Wahhabism with its money became the dominant religion of the world because the Sunni Muslims, although most of them are not Wahhabis, were being brainwashed by the Saudi empowered world scholars. Saudi Arabia started brainwashing the scholar, scholars of various countries and that was attractive to youths, young fools, young stupids, who were learning Islam from Googling. <laughs> the Google mentor became their learning platform for Islam. Now, why did I fall for that? I fell for that because I was shocked. And I, when I made that video, if you all remember, condemning the terrorist attack in, in Paris, I was criticized by many Muslims for speaking out against extremism and that I thought that that had a lot to do with the understanding of Islam and I started understand, interpreting Islam from Maududi's point of view who in fact was the father of the ideology of Islamic statehood. So I drifted away from Islam 
Wahhabi Islam is a kind of absolute Islam. It is a, a form of hard-lying Islam. It is an Islam which has no flexibility. It is a straightforward Islam which is not the Islam of intelligent people, which is not the Islam of wise people, which is not the Islam of, in fact, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yes, peace be upon him. There are many ways that I can debunk all the things that I've said thus far. Now, why did I not under take this understanding so far? Because, my dear friends, again, it all added up when I understood the global politics. The global politics is to kill Islam from within. Yes, to make Islam collapse from within within. After 200 years of European imperialization, Islamic jurisprudence became vacuum in various ways because Islamic jurisprudence couldn't really flourish the way it was expected to flourish because Muslims were always under the dominance of foreign powers who followed different culture, different custom and different religion. And with the economic aggression of Western countries in many ways, the scholars of Muslim world, of the Muslim world became quite vulnerable because they didn't really um, was in, they weren't really in a position to continue their research unhampered. Many of them were attending uh, you know Islamic institutions which didn't teach them what uh, science was all about, what philosophy was all about, what economic, global economy uh, was all about, what uh, um, uh, global various aspects of, uh, of education was all about. Because they were always confined to the Islamic jurisprudence and the studies which were all out of date. So, Muslim scholars were lagging behind, but the only scholars who had money and who had, who had state sponsorship, who had a big economic power to back them up, were the Saudi-sponsored scholars. But the Saudi-sponsored scholars didn't allow interpretation that much, flexibility that much. They didn't allow ijma, kiyas, and things which, which helped Islam keep on reforming over the centuries. To my research, Islam is the most flexible and, and most um, reformative religion because Islam has been reforming and was reforming over the centuries with the help of Islamic jurisprudence, which consisted of, as I said, ijma, qiyas, and other aspects of legal corridors. But this stopped. It became stagnant with the establishment of madrasa system over the last 200 years, mainly by the Britishers. Now, Britain of today is the veteran of, of humanity, is the vanguard of human rights. But I'm talking about Britain of the past, of the imperial past. I'm talking about France, the imperialist past, so these were all having an iron grip on Islamic jurisprudence and were hindering in the flourishment of Islamic jurisprudence. So my dear friends, it has given me a new insight to the understanding of Islam. We, are, we know that Quran is the only divine revelation, but at the same time we know that Muslims value hadiths, but that shouldn't be enough. To understand the hadiths, you also need to the continuance of ijma and kiyas. You can say many things. For example, how am I going to reconcile with the, with the fact that Muhammad, peace be upon him, had a wife who was nine years old? My dear friend, Muhammad was a human being. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a human being. Muslims do not consider him divine. Muslims do not see Muhammad as Christians view Jesus. Muhammad had mistakes. Muhammad was a man of his times. 
manly, humanly mistakes. But he had no mistake when it comes to his responsibility as a prophet. Now, not all of his things, all of his acts are sunnah or are examples for us to emulate. These are the things which calls for scholarly a debate, scholarly opinions. For example, to a Muslim, the most beautiful and the most attractive women are the whores or the women in heaven. Now, these whores or virgins of heaven are all full-bodied women, full-grown women full-bodied women. You can understand that from the uh, description of their bodies in the Quran. So there is no way Quran entices Muslim men to marry children. Now, the age of Aisha is also something that needs to be debated upon. Even if he did marry a nine-year-old, he was a man of his time and he did not instruct that in the Quran Allah didn't instruct that in the Quran to emulate. So these are the things which he needs to discuss. But it seems that the criticism of Islam has become one-sided, hateful, and it has been spreading hate. It has started viewing Muslims as hateful people. And it has subjected Muslims to hate. It is like a wholesale hate for Muslims. We all agree that Muslims overwhelmingly around the world do not marry children. All right, at the 21st century, Muslims around the world do not believe in slaughtering their people of the other faith. It is not happening. So what's the problem? The problem is somehow you have to poke. You have to keep on poking Muslims uh, from the examples of the prophet which are not to be emulated. So what purpose does it serve? It doesn't. Rather, we all agree that we should not marry children. We all agree that we should not kill people for difference of opinions. We all agree that people should not be banished from their lands simply for difference of opinions. And we should all agree on various other things in, uh, according to the understanding of universal humanity. So what is there, the purpose of poking the entire community on the basis of confined or narrow interpretations by the Wahhabis? What point does it serve rather than creating animosity amongst the communities. So Islam is reforming with the interpretations and that needs to continue. I am going to make videos now continuously debunking all the arguments that I put forward thus far against Islam. And I will try my best to make sure that people can still debate with me with full respect it seems that atheism has taken the form of a religion. Oh, you can say, oh, come on, come on. Atheism is not a religion, which I always said. I know all your arguments that collecting a stamp is a hobby. Not collecting a stamp is not a hobby. But don't forget, religions like Hinduism gets its sources from Sriti, Sruti, Riti. And obviously, Sastra, Siti, Suti, Riti. And this Riti, for example, is custom, customary behavior as well. So, atheists have started behavior in certain patterns. Atheists have started acting in certain patterns when it comes to dealing with religions or religious people. That has thus become a form of religion which doesn't need to have a divine entity at its core. So, dear friends, I have also become subject of various hate-mongering, threats, abuses from atheists who thus far had considered me their friends. And also I have become subject to hate from 
people who hate not only Islam, but Muslims as a whole. And probably you will see some of the comments underneath this video, underneath this video confirming what I'm saying. Thank you for listening. Take care. Peace be unto you.